Last week in our Live to Give series, uh, we talked about the subject of how to be rich. And it was based on Pastor Andy Stanley's book by the same title, How to Be Rich. If you missed it, I encourage you to go online and watch the message or, or, or listen to it. So today, uh, we're going to talk about how to get rich. Now, I have discovered a lot of people are interested in this topic. <laughs> have you found that to be true? A lot of people want to know how to get rich. So today, I want to contrast two different ways of getting rich. One way might be called the conventional wisdom of the world. And the second way would be called the unconventional wisdom of Jesus Christ. Let me explain. Conventional wisdom says that money is just about math. That's all it is. It's just about math. The more you get, the richer you are, right? Sounds simple enough. And if you give some of what you have away, then you have less. You're left with fewer. So, by giving, conventional wisdom says, you lose. It's just a numbers deal. To illustrate, you've got a few stacks of Monopoly money, some pretend money, because we can be generous with pretend money, right? <laughs> got a stack of $1 bills here, 10 $1 bills. All right? So if I give one away, then how many do I have left? Very good. We've been talking a lot about tithing these days. Many of you have taken the tithing challenge. Close to 400 people have uh, taken that challenge, nearly half of whom are first-time tithers, and that is outstanding stuff. Yeah, that, that, that's really big. <laughs> Giving one out of 10 is a tithe or 10%. But conventional wisdom says, if I don't give any away, I have 10 left. So conventional wisdom says, I have more. If I don't give, I have less if I do give. It's, it's just a numbers deal. Now, I got a stack of $10 bills here. So altogether, I got $100 in Monopoly money, right? That's a little bit more money. So I might even be more reluctant to give some of it away. And one of the things that we've talked about is if you're interested in tithing or giving in general, it would be a good idea to start doing it when you're younger, when you have less money, because the more money you have, the harder it is to get in the habit of giving some of it away, right? Now, this is a stack of $100 bills. SpongeBob Monopoly. <laughs> so I've got a stack of, I've got, this is $1,000. Now, I got $1,000. I really start thinking hard when I'm faced with tithing on this amount. And when I got this amount of money, I say things to myself like this. You know, there's a lot I could do with $1,000. If I give one of these away, that's $100. There's a lot I could do with $100. I don't know if I want to give that much money away. You see, money plays with your mind like that, right? Money just does funny things to people. Conventional wisdom says this. Make as much as you can and keep as much as you make because the more you give, the less you have, and the less you give, the more you have. If you have $10 and you give one away, 10 minus 1 is 9. But if you have $10 and you give nothing, 10 minus 0 equals 10, and 10 is more than 9. Everybody with me so far? Yeah. This is deep, I understand. Conventional wisdom says money is just about math. Keeping it is the better strategy to get rich than giving it. It's just a numbers thing. There is, however, another way to see money. And this is the way of unconventional wisdom. This is the counterintuitive way. This is talked about down through history from a lot of folks, but never more clearly than Jesus Christ. This is just one of the many unconventional things Jesus said about money. He said, give, and it will be what? 
given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, now this is not necessarily a command that Jesus is giving here. Jesus isn't saying here, you ought to give, you should, but that's not what he's really saying here. No, I, I think Jesus is just making an observation about the way life works best. This is about how things really are. This is a claim that the conventional wisdom of the world about money is wrong. In fact, you can even test this. We'll come back to that in a moment. What's interesting is, is when you start to look for it, you see this claim, you see this other way, you see this unconventional wisdom all through the writings of the Bible. For example, this is from the Old Testament. This is from the book of Proverbs. The writer of Proverbs says, one person gives freely, yet what? Gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to what? A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. Here's one more passage. This is from the apostle Paul. Paul writes this in his letter to the church at Corinth. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work, as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower, not the keeper, but the sower, and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way. Why? So that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Paul says something very profound here that we dare not miss. He says, I want you to think of generosity not in terms of keeping or losing, but I want you to think of generosity in terms of sowing and reaping. Now, this puts giving in another category. This puts giving in another dimension. Think about Paul's picture here for just a minute. John Ortberg makes a stunning claim that there really has only been in the history of the human race one major economic revolution, at least as he sees it. We live in a day of amazing technology advancement and medical breakthroughs, but there's only one revolution that has really fundamentally changed how human beings did things. His argument goes like this. For who knows how long human beings roamed from one place to another. They lived from one day to the next. They scavenged and they foraged for food wherever they could find it until one day, the greatest in innovator in human history, we don't even know his name or her name, made a discovery and looked for some investors and maybe told them something like this. I want you to give me whatever grains, whatever seeds you have found that you've been storing up so you could eat them. And instead of eating them, which is what we've always done, I want you to put them in the ground. I know this sounds stupid. I get it. But I think I may have discovered something about how life works previously unknown to the human race that's going to blow your mind. If you take your supply of seed and put it in the ground, I call this sowing, he says, something happens. Some kind of power gets unleashed. I don't fully understand it, but it's like something up in the sky says to something down in the ground, hey, wake up, come alive, grow, and it does. I know it sounds crazy, but it works. Trust me, run a little test on this and see if this is not so. Ortberg says, this is the very first startup in the history of the world. 
It's quite possible, he suggests, this is how startups got their names. You put a little seed in the ground and it starts up. Get it? I didn't think it was that funny either. <laughs> God says through the apostle Paul and other writers in scripture, generosity works like that. Money is like that. Take some of what you have. He, he told Israel 10% and sow it. Give it away. I, it sounds crazy, I know, but if you do, something happens. Some kind of power gets unleashed. It's like something up in the sky says to something on earth, wake up, come alive, grow, and it does. If you sow richly, you'll reap richly. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Give, and it will be given to you. Now, please understand something. I hope you get this. This is not about what is commonly referred to as the prosperity gospel, where you give so the pastor can get a Bentley or a private jet plane. This is not a sneaky way for either the pastor or the parishioners to get affluent. In fact, if you're aiming at trying to be affluent in the world's economy, you're going to go wrong every time. Paul tells you exactly why God wants to bless you. Now listen again to these words. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. Randy Alcorn writes some marvelous words about this verse. Look at what he says. Abundance isn't God's provision for me to live in luxury. Abundance is God's provision for me to help others live. God entrusts me with his money not to build my kingdom on earth, but to allow his kingdom to come to earth. Those are fantastic statements. You may be thinking somebody ought to test this. Somebody ought to see if this can be empirically verified. As it turns out, somebody already has. There's a most interesting and revealing book titled The Paradox of Generosity, and it's by a sociologist at the University of Notre Dame by the name of Christian Smith, who along with his graduate assistant has done the kind of definitive research and field study to look at the impact of generosity in the lives of real people. They surveyed over 2,000 folks in a nationally representative survey, and then they did in-depth interviews with scores of people. They used the best tools of social science to test the premise, what does generosity do for people? A, a person who gives at least 10% of their income away, are they really better off? Is the conventional wisdom right? If you give it away, do you lose it? Are you impoverished if you give? Or is the unconventional of wisdom advocated by the scriptures the right way to go? And here's a summary of their research. Christian Smith writes, generosity is paradoxical. Those who give receive back in turn. By spending ourselves for others', others well-being, we enhance our own standing. In letting go some of what we own, we better secure our own lives. By giving ourselves away, we ourselves move toward flourishing. This is not only a philosophical or religious teaching. It is a sociological fact. The generosity paradox, he states, can also be stated in the negative. By grasping on to what we currently have, we lose out on better goods that we might have gained. Isn't that interesting? In holding on to what we possess, we diminish its long-term value to us. By always protecting ourselves against future uncertainties and misfortunes, we are affected in ways that make us more anxious about uncertainties and vulnerable to future misfortunes. In short, he summarizes, by failing to care for others, we do not properly take care of ourselves. That is the paradox of generosity. This is an amazing study. Throughout the book, they contrast based on empirical research. You know, this is regardless of what you think about the, what the Bible or other spiritual traditions say about generosity. I'm talking about just empirical research. They look at two different ways of life. They call the one way of life a generous heart. These are people who regularly and freely give away a significant portion of their valued resources, their money, their time. They, they give this away to others to help others versus what they term the ungenerous heart. The ungenerous heart are people who do not give away of their money or of their valued resources, their time. And guess what they found out? 
Guess what this extensive research revealed? It turns out in every dimension studied, and here's what they looked at, levels of happiness, physical health, having a sense of purpose for living, the avoidance of depression, and personal growth. They found out, I know it's going to blow your mind, generous people are enriched in every way and ungenerous people are diminished in every way. It turns out Jesus was right. Imagine that. <laughs> it turns out that ungenerosity actually cost more than generosity in every measurable regard. To illustrate how this works, we're going to take a bit of a hard left, and we're going to look at perhaps the most unbelievably ungenerous heart in all the Bible. It belonged to a guy named Pharaoh. Anybody ever heard of Pharaoh? This is how the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, starts. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing. Now, the reason that little phrase is there is because in the book of Genesis, we learn that actually it was the work of Joseph and of his people, Israel, that enriched Egypt and Pharaoh so much. But there is a new king, there is a new Pharaoh who has no gratitude in his heart and no regard for Joseph or his people. Then a new king to whom Joseph meant nothing came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous and if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor and built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. Christian Smith found out that one of the ways generosity leads to flourishing is that generosity tends to reduce what he termed dysfunctional self-absorption. Now, that is a highfalutin phrase that means ungenerous people tend to fixate on themselves in unhealthy ways and ruminate over their problems and degenerate into obsessive egocentrism. Pharaoh is the poster boy for this behavior in the Bible. All he can think about is himself, and it impoverishes his heart at every level. I have to have more slaves so I can have more bricks, so I can have more storage units, so I can hoard more wealth. How much do you have, Pharaoh? Not enough. How much do you need? More. Pharaoh is the richest guy in Egypt, and he is the most financially insecure guy in Egypt. He's miserable over what he might lose. Smith also found in his research ungenerous hearts pay a relational cost. Moses is sent to Pharaoh by God, and Moses says, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh knows if he is generous with them, if he allows them any time off, it means less bricks for him. So he's not about to be generous. His goal is more bricks. That's how he sees the Israelites. He needs Israel to be more motivated to make him more bricks. So how do you motivate people well? Well, Pharaoh gets a brilliant idea. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. They are lazy. That is why they're crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people. Incredibly motivating. Would you agree with that? <laughs> Pharaoh says to Israelites, what people with more, we defined that last week, often say to people who have less, lazy. That's what you are, lazy. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, no. Go get your own. Yet produce the same quota of bricks. People with ungenerous hearts have a way of developing a, distorted, a distorted view of other people. There's a woman at Princeton named Susan Fisk, and she has done some fascinating research on how we look at other people. She's done a lot of research around stereotyping. And she says, in stereotyping people, we use two main dimensions. So let's say you see a stranger in an alley coming at you. You tend to rate them. You tend to evaluate them along two lines. Number one, do they have good or harm? 
for me? Do they intend good or harm for me? This is what she calls the warmth factor. And then we ask, are they able to carry out their intention or not? And this is called the competence factor, the competence factor. And she says, basically, we tend to put people in one of four quadrants based on how high or low the warmth is or how high or low the competence is. Some people we would judge as being high in warmth and high in competence. These are good, strong people. They're able to do what they want to do. They are our heroes. We esteem these people. So you see that right up here in this uh, quadrant? High warmth, high incompetence. These people are esteemed. Now, if we were to think, let's have a little fun with this. If we were to think in terms of, let's say, football teams in Florida, <laughs> and how they're doing this season, it's college football, okay? We would probably put Florida State Seminoles and the Florida Gators there, depending on what team you're a fan of. Maybe you're a, you know, Seminole. Maybe you're one of these, okay? Yeah. All right, it's okay. So you're a fan. You admire them. You, you esteem them, all right? Now, then there are some people we would say that are high in competence, but they're low in warmth. We have a low opinion of them. We may envy these people and what they're able to do, they produce, but we don't like them. And again, in keeping with our sports metaphor, we can just put the Florida State Seminoles, <laughs> Florida, again, depending on what team you're a fan of. I mean, if you esteem this team, you probably, I don't know if you'd envy this team or not, but they're competent, all right? Both teams just have one loss this year. Then up in this quadrant, we have people that our hearts move toward. We put them in the high warmth category, but they're low in competence. These are the lovable losers. We pity these people. They're likable, but you don't expect anything from them. You can't depend on them. So we're going to put the UCF Knights right there. <laughs> we like them, but they just can't get it done right now, okay? <laughs> but there's one more quadrant we haven't talked about, and this is interesting. This is the only one where there's nothing positive about this quadrant at all. These are people who are low in warmth and they're low in competence. These are people we don't like. They seemingly can't do anything. They have nothing to offer. Susan Fisk says these people, uh, what we despise, they elicit contempt from us. We secretly or not so secretly despise the people in this quadrant. So we're gonna put the Miami Hurricanes right there. <laughs> Now, I think we just lost some tithers who are hurricane fans. <laughs> These people are definitely going to be asking for their money back, I have a feeling. Now, here's what's interesting in her research. Dr. Fisk says that in our society, we put poor people in the despised quadrant. We put homeless people there. We put people from other races or religions we don't like there. We put undocumented immigrants there. Some of you might put people from a political point of view that you just can't stand there. But what's really interesting about this, just from a purely biblical perspective, is when Jesus came to earth, he was God incarnate. He was God in a bod. You don't get higher in competence than that. You don't get higher in warmth. But take a look at the chart one more time real quick. Jesus came from here, but he came as one of these. He was here, but he came here. Jesus said one time, foxes have dens, birds have nests, but the Son of Man, that is Jesus, has no place to lay his head. In other words, Jesus was homeless. Paul echoed this sentiment when he wrote to the believers in Corinth, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become what? 
I want to say this to everybody here who's a follower of Jesus. Maybe you're, maybe you're not, and that's okay. That's okay. We're really glad you're here. Everybody's welcome. But this is for you if you follow Jesus. A unique writer named Shane Claiborne put it like this. You cannot worship a homeless man on Sunday and ignore one on Monday. Jesus says, whatever you do for one of the least of these, you do for me. He says, when you see one of these, you're looking at me. Generous hearts understand this. Generous hearts begin to build bridges. Ungenerous hearts build walls. That's another fact that Christian Smith's research uncovered. Here it is. Ungenerous hearts live in increasing isolation. They live in increasing isolation. Life just works that way. Here's something else he discovered. Ungenerous people have a lower sense of meaning and purpose in their lives. Instead of being the oppressor of Israel, you know, Pharaoh could have been the hero of Israel. He could have said, you know what, Moses? I want you to go. I want you to worship your God. I'm going to give you that freedom. I'm going to be your benefactor. I'll be your champion. He could have been the Abraham Lincoln, the Nelson Mandela of Israel. They would have built statues for him. They would have cheered for him and loved him. Instead of doing that, you know what he was doing with all these bricks? He was building himself a pyramid. Does anybody remember what goes inside a pyramid? He was saying, I'm going to build the world's greatest structure, and then when I die, I'm going to move my dead carcass in there, and everybody's going to go, wow, how impressive is this? You see, ungenerous hearts tend to live for wretched, miserable little egos, and they build giant monuments into which their dead carcass can be stored. They could have lived for a noble cause, but they chose to focus exclusively on themselves. Another cost of the ungenerous heart that Christian Smith found was anxiety. Ungenerous people become increasingly anxious people. It turns out that ungenerous people rationalize their ungenerosity by convincing themselves year after year, day after day, hey, this world is a place of scarcity. This world is a place of not enoughness. So I got to hang on to all of these, every single one of these that I can, because my clutching is actually justified by the wretched world that we live in. Here's the thing, though. As long as money is the chief source of my security, money will be the chief source of my anxiety. As long as money is the chief source of my security, it will always be the chief source of my anxiety. That's why we live in the most affluent age in human history in the middle of unbelievable financial anxiety. You might have seen this. The tre Treasury Department is considering printing a new version of the dollar bill. Have you heard about this? And this reflects how people feel about the economic reality in our day. Just take a look at George right there. <laughs> you might see that in circulation soon, right? That's, how, that's, that's our world, right? Christian Smith puts it like this. Practicing generosity requires and reinforces the perception of living in a world of abundance and blessing. You know, here's what Jesus said about that one day. Jesus said, you know what you ought to do when you get anxious? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store in barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them every day. Or he said, you know what you ought to do? Consider the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, Solomon, remember that guy? In all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Jesus said, this homeless man who had no nest, who had no hole, he said that. It turns out practicing generosity requires and reinforces the perception of living in a world of abundance and blessing, which is itself increases happiness and health. It turns out, listen, it turns out that the universe we inhabit is located in a spiritual reality that actually favors generosity. The world is weighted toward the generous heart. It turns out you and I were hardwired to give. It turns out you reap what you sow. Smith writes about people who discovered this joy. One of the generous people he studied is a guy named Ken Walker. This is a guy who's generous with his money. He's generous with his time. He's also generous with his blood. He's a regular blood donor. 
Now, most of us probably don't think of getting stuck by a needle and giving away blood as a joyful thing, right? This is basically what Ken Walker said. He said, I'm extremely competitive. I started giving blood at work. I think they came in three or four times a year. I would give blood each time. He said, I was also training hard and I was very fit. They would come in and give instructions. It should take four minutes to give one pint of blood and how everybody's blood typically comes out with that brown sludge chocolate syrup color. He says, mine came out eraser pink, and I'm cranking out a pint in two minutes and 47 seconds. <laughs> the dude is actually timing his blood donations. And they're like, what are you doing? He says, I'm winning. <laughs> the guy is pouring out his blood, and he thinks he's winning something. Oddly enough, it turns out having your body give blood and regenerating blood actually boosts the oxygen content of the blood in your body. It actually makes your blood transport more efficiently. It turns out even your body, even your blood is somehow hardwired to give. It's like give and it will be given to you is encoded in your bloodstream. Somebody ought to test that the next time the big red bus comes around. <laughs> That's why we're doing this tithe challenge. God says, test me. Just test me in this. Run your own little experiment. Scores of folks are doing this at our church. That's why I'm so thrilled about that, so unapologetic about this challenge. I love teaching on giving because I know it helps people. Yeah, I get some criticism, but that's okay. It helps people. It frees people. I just have to tell you something. I just got told before this service, these ladies that sit down in the front here, the Jaya ladies, we call them just as you are, Pastor Al Hoover, who leads the ministry with Sue he said, John, I want to tell you, he said, all these Jaya girls, and these are ladies that are in the last stages of incarceration. They're about to be released at some point. He said, they're all tithing. Amazing. I, I tell you, I, I just know. I know what God does. When we honor him like that, that's, that's so amazing to me. So you can fill out that card if you haven't done that already. You can go online and you can just say, I'm going to be a part of the tithe challenge. And I, I'll say again, if God is not clearly blessing you, if what Paul describes, that you will be enriched in every way so you can be generous on every occasion, if that's not happening, we'll gladly return that tithe money to you, no questions asked, at the end of that 90 days. Here's a couple practical questions and answers about this because folks are raising some through this series. Some folks have wondered this. I'm married, and my spouse and I are on very different pages when it comes to money and tithing and generosity. What should I do? And I would say around that one, marital harmony always takes priority. This might be a good chance if you are married to talk about your financial life. What are your financial goals? I've known folks in marriages where one person wanted to tithe or they wanted to give and the other one didn't. So the one that did, did so on their own income stream, if they had an income stream of their own, but not on their spouses. I would say just make the best arrangement you can that will strengthen and not strain your relationship together. Here's another question. I tithe with my time I tithe with my time so I don't have to tithe with my money, right? You know, that idea is actually not in the Bible. In fact, it's kind of interesting. Christian Smith discovered that generous people tend to be generous with both their money and their time, and ungenerous people tend to be ungenerous both with their money and their time. The two very much go together. In fact, when God delivered Israel from slavery, he gave them both the practice of tithing and the practice of Sabbath. And it's like God is saying, hey, Israel, 90% of your income with my blessing is actually more than 100% without it. Hey, Israel, six days of your week with my blessing is actually more productive than seven days without it. Test me on this. I believe tithing and Sabbath, are, they're, they're, there's something connected there. We want to be a church that's financially generous, but we're flourishing in serving and in volunteering. And maybe part of your generosity will be, God, how are you calling me to be generous with my time and my energy and my talents as well as with my money? Because give and it will be given to you. As you sow, you'll reap. A generous person prospers. Friends, that's reality. 
That's the unconventional wisdom of scriptures, and it can be scientifically verified. But I want to just close by saying this. That's not the greatest case for being generous. You want to know the greatest case for being generous? Here it is. The greatest man who ever lived one day said this, truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. That is a bold and daring claim. Somebody ought to test that. And one day somebody did. The Bible says that for the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross. For the joy set before him, Jesus poured out his blood like he thought he was winning. And they buried his dead body in the ground like you do a seed, like a kernel of wheat. And then I know this sounds crazy, but something happened. Some kind of power got unleashed in our world. It's like someone in the sky said to someone in the ground, wake up. Come alive, and he did. It's true. It's the reality in which we live, in which we give, in which we gather, and in which we go. I'm thankful for that unconventional path to follow Jesus, aren't you? Let's stand together. Let's stand with me. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you know the truth about us. You know the truth about me. And the truth is, I have a greedy, grabby little heart. And God, I pray for me. I pray for everybody in this room. I pray for anybody watching in other places that you'll help us die to all the clutching and the fear and anxiety and self-obsession that is just killing us. Would you help us die to all that and just bury it all? And would you make something new come alive, God? Lord, I want to live in a world where little non-anxious birds are fed by a generous heavenly Father and where lilies grow gratuitously on a hillside that nobody ever sees with a beauty that is breathtaking. I want to live in the reality and security and ease and freedom that Jesus knew. In our best selves, God, we all want that. So would you help us, God? Would you help us now? We pray in Jesus' name. We all said